And how does one counter this influence? Through constant innovation, India's ISRO is showing the way, not resting on its laurels. Just days after the grand success of the moon landing, India's space agency is gearing up for the next adventure. And this time, India is going to the sun. The mission is called Aditya L1. Aditya means the sun in Sanskrit. And what is the meaning of L1? That's the final destination of this mission. I'll explain in a bit. Let's start with the launch, though. It is scheduled for the 2nd of September, this Saturday. And what is the meaning of Aditya L1, rather? And what is the meaning of L1? That's the final destination of the mission. I'll explain in a bit. Let's start with the launch. It is scheduled for the 2nd of September, that is this Saturday. This is a mission to study the sun's atmosphere and environment. The spacecraft weighs 1,500 kilos. It is carrying special equipment to be used for scientific experiments. Aditya L1 has a long list of objectives. The ISRO wants to know more about the sun's outer layer. It is called the corona. Not the kind of corona that China became famous for. This is about the sun. ISRO wants to understand how the sun works. And by that, I mean solar activity. How it affects the planets in our solar system. Things like solar flares and solar winds. How do they affect the Earth? ISRO will try to answer all these questions with this mission. It plans to travel to a very special location near the Sun. It is called the Lagrange Point 1, or L1, the one that we mentioned earlier. And what is special about L1? Let me use the example of a seesaw to understand how this works. How does a seesaw work? It always tilts on the heavier side. And when that happens, the lighter side goes up. And the person on the heavier side goes down. The Earth and the Sun work in a similar way, like two sides of a seesaw. They're constantly shifting. The Sun is very large, so it, it exerts a lot of force, a great force on the Earth, gravitational force. And the Earth is constantly moving around the Sun, so it, it cancels out the Sun's gravitational force. Now imagine if you were to sit at the center of the seesaw. What would happen? Neither end would rise or fall. The seesaw would be balanced. And this spot of balance is what scientists call the Lagrange point, or L1, and that's where Aditya L1 plans to go. Why choose this specific point? It's like having the perfect seat at a concert. You get the best view, and that's what ISRO is after. The spacecraft would remain in position. It will not feel the impact of gravity, plus it will save fuel. And the views are great. There won't be any obstruction. The US Space Agency, NASA, agrees. It says, at L1, you'll get an uninterrupted view of the sun. So we're hoping for some good pictures, but getting there is no cakewalk. The L1 spot is one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth. Now, we try to do some math here. If you were to drive your car to L1 at 100 kilometers per hour, you'd take almost two years to get there. And I'll be honest, our maths is not as good as ISRO scientists, but even we know that you can't drive cars in space. So this was just to give you an idea of how far it is. Of course, ISRO has figured out a more efficient way of getting there. They say it will take four months for the spacecraft to reach. And this is a very important mission. You see, the sun is the nearest star to the Earth, and it behaves a bit like Thanos with its five infinity stones. It releases immense amounts of energy. Scientists have a term for it. Eruptive phenomena, that's what they call it. Simply put, it means large bursts of energy, sort of like the sun catching a cold and sneezing. Now, we don't know what happens after that. And by we, I mean humankind. We don't know. We have, we have a very limited understanding of how the sun works. We need to study it better and also to prepare for situations that may potentially harm our planet. Aditya L1 aims to deliver this to help us understand what's going on up there. And in typical ISRO style, this is a mission on a budget. The government of India cleared it in 2019. $46 million were set aside for this mission. That's less than Chandrayaan, Chandrayaan 3's budget. The moon mission cost $75 million. And it proved to be a good investment. It has detect detected sulfur and other elements near the moon's south pole. Now, ISRO is aiming for the sun. And 1.4 billion Indians are cheering them on. Our next story is about a company, a company that has become one of America's biggest strategic assets, a company called NVIDIA. It's a technology giant. It calls itself a world leader in artificial intelligence computing. 
and it's been making headlines. The U.S. government has passed a new order. It bars NVIDIA from exporting chips to some countries in West Asia. Now, this is a very significant move. And to understand why, we must understand what NVIDIA makes. They make a special kind of computer chips. They're called GPUs, graphics processing units. They process graphics on computers. So if you play games on your computer, or if you're into graphic design, there's a good chance that you use NVIDIA chips. They're very advanced. And the US sees them as a strategic tool, so much so that they're dictating who can get their hands on NVIDIA chips. Like I said, the Biden administration has issued orders blocking the sale of chips to some West Asian countries. Earlier, they'd restricted NVIDIA chip sales to China, and this applied to advanced chips. Washington feared that they would help the PLA, the Chinese army. Now, we don't know which countries have been banned in West Asia. They have not shared names. And NVIDIA's statement does not say very much, but most reports throw up two names, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. This year, these two countries have placed a lot of orders. They bought up thousands of NVIDIA chips. Riyadh alone bought 3,000 chips. What about the UAE? We don't have a number, but we're given to understand that the UAE gave orders in a similar range, meaning thousands of graphic chips. And now the US is throttling the supply. The new rules apply not just to NVIDIA, but to all chip makers, but we're focusing on one company because it's the most in demand. Major Chinese companies have placed orders here, Baidu. ByteDance, Tencent, Alibaba, many other Chinese companies have given large orders. Together, the bill is set to be more than $5 billion. Deliveries were supposed to happen next year, but now Washington has stepped in. And they will decide who gets what and how much of it. What explains the surge in demand? The explosion of AI. NVIDIA chips are the driving force behind AI services, artificial intelligence. Applications like ChatGPT run on them. These chips are used to train ChatGPT. In fact, most AI apps run on NVIDIA chips. They're preferred because they can multitask. They can process multiple commands simultaneously, and they're the market leader in this game. I think it's a surprise, but not a surprise. Uh, you know, I think that the paradigm of compute is changing. Uh, they have a monopoly, uh, at least today, in terms of accelerated compute. Uh, and uh, with generative AI and large language models, it's unleashed the power, you know, of accelerated compute. And, you know, they're the only game in town. All countries and tech companies worth their salt are entering the AI race. Microsoft has Bing, Google has Bard, China's Baidu has launched the Ernie bot. Saudi Arabia and the UAE have their own plans. All of them need NVIDIA chips, hence the unprecedented demand. It's a dream run for this company. It's made them one of the most valuable companies in the world. The stock price has gone through the roof. This year, they saw a jump of 234%. And the rally is far from over. Experts say NVIDIA will rise further. Some are predicting a jump of 125%. Earlier this year, the company broke another record. It entered the $1 trillion club. Today, it is worth $1.2 trillion. And this is a very small club, the Trillion Dollar Club. Apple sits at the top, followed by Microsoft, Saudi Aramco, Alphabet, Amazon, and finally, NVIDIA. Do you notice something here? How many of these companies are American? Five out of six. And all of these five are tech companies. Aramco is an oil company. And this puts the US in a unique position. It gives America significant leverage over the global economy and over global markets. American policies can dictate supplies and influence pricing. A favorable policy will keep supplies steady and the price is low, but a protectionist approach will disrupt supplies and push up prices. In other words, the US can weaponize its tech companies. This will lead to a trade war, but America would have a clear advantage. And this is not hypothetical. We've seen it in the recent past. During the Trump years, the US used its dominant position. President Donald Trump announced trade restrictions. He forced countries to extend more favorable terms. And some of those policies are still in place. So while countries still go to war in the traditional sense of the term, they're also in a position to wage war by other means. In this changing geopolitical landscape, corporate giants can be weaponized. And there is no guarantee that superpowers will wield this power responsibly. No matter where it came from, what it was about, 
Every story we have discussed so far has centered around one topic, statecraft, a topic deeply loved by a singularly important Indian manual. I'm talking about Kautilya's Arthashastra. At the risk of sounding like Shah Rukh Khan, let me assume that you've heard the name before. This manuscript talks about the art of politics. It was written in the second or third AD, yet even today it holds water. But here's a fun fact. For a long time, Arthashastra had disappeared until this man, R. Shamashastri, rediscovered it in the year 1904. He was a Sanskrit scholar. After finding Arthashastra, he published the book in the year 1909, then translated it into English in 1915. And today, the Arthashastra is one of the most valued texts ever written the world over. But I wonder, had Shamashastri not known Sanskrit, what would have happened? Would he have known the worth of this manuscript? I ask because today is World Sanskrit Day a day to celebrate the Sanskrit language, fondly called Devani, or the language of the gods. It is considered about 3,500 years old, one of the oldest languages in the world. Ancient Hindu texts like the Vedas were written in Sanskrit. Languages like Bengali, Punjabi, and Gujarati trace their origins to Sanskrit. So do some words in English, like opal, from Sanskrit upala, or candy, from khandaka. Even the word Zen, which evolved from Dhyan, in fact, the Chinese word for meditation, Chan, also comes from Dhyan. So every August 31st, the world celebrates a Sanskrit day to raise awareness about the language. But here's the irony. There's a good chance you did not even know that this day existed. And I do not mean to be pessimistic, but let's be honest. Sanskrit is a dying language. And with each passing day, fewer people care about it. Let me show you some numbers. In 1971, about 2,000 Indians called Sanskrit their mother tongue. In 1991, this number was close to 50,000. 50,000 people in India called Sanskrit their mother tongue. By 2011, it had dropped to about 25,000. We are a country of 1.4 billion people, the birthplace of the Sanskrit language, and less than 25,000 people call this language their mother tongue. Do you know the result of these falling numbers? A child named Vishnu is nicknamed Vish. Now, Vishnu is a common name in India. It is Sanskrit for, for the preserver, the name of a god, Vishnu. Vish, on the other hand, means poison in Sanskrit. You see, this is what happens when a language faces a slow death. Its words are literally poisoned. Vishnu becomes Vish. But some of you may still wonder, is Sanskrit even dying? After all, Hindus usually recite most of their prayers in Sanskrit. They conduct ceremonial rituals in this language. Some children in India study Sanskrit in middle school. Kids still have Sanskritized names, keeping the whole Vishnu Vishdabakal aside. But let me ask you, how many children see merit in learning Sanskrit? Won't they rather learn French or Spanish? How many people? actually understand the prayers they recite. Some experts say only about 100,000 people worldwide understand the prayers they recite. Clearly, rote learning words does not keep a language alive. But that does not necessarily kill it either. So here's the golden question. How does a language die? It happens when there are no surviving speakers. Dilution of the language hastens the space of death. Languages like ancient Greek, Akkadian or Aramaic are extinct. Sanskrit is quickly moving in that direction because of a number of reasons. The language was rarely transmitted in the written word, and this is a recent phenomenon for Sanskrit. Most Sanskrit knowledge was transmitted orally. It happened in the Gurukul systems. But as they collapsed, the knowledge was lost. Secondly, Sanskrit was always limited to a small circle of people, usually the Hindu priests. They did not allow it to reach the common people. And when that happens to a language, it dies a natural death. Today, it seems like Sanskrit has no value to offer. But let me bring back the example of the manuscripts. India has over 35 million of them. And they're not limited to India. Elsewhere in South Asia, there are more than 150,000. Reports say Europe has at least 60,000. And some reports say 95% of these manuscripts have never been translated. Two-thirds of these are in Sanskrit. 
So for everyone who says that Sanskrit holds no value, let me remind you, no one knows what two thirds of those manuscripts hold. It's a mine of knowledge and we've barely scratched the surface. Sanskrit is one of the greatest classical languages. It showcases the genius of India. It is a window into the lives of the people who came before us. And in any culture, understanding and appreciating the past is crucial to moving forward. So yesterday, today, tomorrow, Sanskrit will be relevant. It is not dying. It is dormant. It's for us to do our bit, to resuscitate it. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Florida, Hurricane Idalia left behind a trail of destruction and debris, destroying houses and entire towns, in fact. In South Africa, a blaze engulfed an entire apartment block in Johannesburg. More than 70 people have been killed. And there will be no monkey business at this year's G20. New Delhi has installed cutouts of langurs to deal with rogue monkeys ahead of the summit. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1997, Princess Diana died in a car crash in Paris. She was being pursued by paparazzi when the car spun out of control and crashed. Diana was taken to hospital, but she succumbed to her injury. She was only 36 year old at the time. We're leaving you with this. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.